Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for your colleagues at Finding Mastery for being here. Um, you've been here, you know, five or six times. It's always a treat to be here, to feel the energy at the university and um, to wrestle with what I would consider the hardest problems in life are the things that we can't see and we can't quite understand how they really work, but we know that they're true. And I'm talking about our inner lives. And so the questions that come from your students are thought provoking and earnest. And so I always look forward to the challenge. So even though we've done this a few times, I told you before, and I, when he asked, what's your purpose today? And I said, this is gonna be the best discussion we've ever had with, with Dr. Mike, and I believe it. Um, they have so many questions. I have so many questions, and I just want to get rid of it. All right. So let's start with a glossary of terms, so everyone sort of understands the baseline. So we'll talk about mindfulness, mastery, competition. How do you define mindfulness, and why is it such a foundational tool? I'm going to use the inspirations and the definition from John Kabat-Zinn, uh, who's a mentor, teacher of mine, a legend in the field uh, and discipline of mindfulness. It's a particular way of attending to the present moment without judgment and critique. A particular way of focusing because it's unique to you. There's a unique contour in the way that you focus on the present moment and the way that I focus on the present moment. So mindfulness is about increasing your awareness of what is, what's happening in here and what's happening out here. And if we drill down one more level, it's awareness of your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, your physiology, and the unfolding world around you. So it's a particular way of being in the present moment without judgment and critique. It's a unique way that you're contouring to the present moment to increase. There's a practice, a skill of mindfulness, and a state of mindfulness. And the way that you're attending to the present moment is the state or the experience of it. The way you practice it, that's a different conversation. And then once we drill right down into it, it's attending to those four or five attributes so that you can better adjust eloquently to the unfolding, unpredictable present moment. And so being in the present moment without judgment, does that put you, you know, more as an observer of feelings and thoughts and actions as opposed to being the one experiencing them? Is that part of the goal? So let's now separate. So mindfulness, which is a wonderfully confusing idea about mindfulness. There's a skill to it, there's a state of being, and over time it becomes an enduring trait. So you become, when you have a trait um, that you've earned, it's something that carries with you in most rooms or places that you go to. So that's, that's kind of what we're looking for for anything that we're training. And in this particular conversation, we're talking about training the skill of mindfulness. So when you are doing the work in the training, you most of the time are working to observe without judgment or critique. So you're watching, paying attention, noting, saying hello and goodbye, you're coming back to the present moment. There's two basic types of training I'll talk about. So that's the observational, it seems passive, but you're really working to come back to this moment. And over time, you get to this state part. It's like, okay, I can be mindful, I can be aware. That is not passive. It, it's having access to rich information about what's actually happening now. And so what that helps us to do is be in the present moment more often. And when we're in the present moment, everything happens in that moment. Everything that happens in life is happening in the present moment. High performance is expressed in that moment. Wisdom is revealed in that moment. Love and the, the challenging emotions as well are experienced there. So a whole inner game is can you get to this moment and be fully you, even when it's difficult and charged and electric or toxic or high stress, high pressure, exacting types of environments, can you be fully here and bring all of your skills to that moment, whatever is demanding of you in that moment. So this whole training process that I've dedicated my life to understand and hopefully share with people is to help them be in the present moment more often. Mindfulness is foundational. I do not think um, you can work around it. It's working with it, meaning that I don't, people will say hack and shortcut and 
tricks and tips and seven steps, that's all hogwash. There, there is none of that on the path of mastery. It does not exist. Don't buy it. Clickbait. It's not what you are really looking for. What you're really looking for is sustainable practices to be in the present moment more often. That takes a lifetime. And when you have an understanding of how to be fully you in the present moment more often, life gets a little bit easier. Right? It just, and then you, so we know this from high performing anything, we'll talk about sport, is that at first you work to express a skill, whether it's a technical skill or a psychological skill, in a calm environment. And if you can do it in a calm environment, we ramp it up. So you do it in a little bit more of a stressful environment, then maybe a rugged environment, and then maybe a hostile environment, and then maybe the most consequential environments. But you're laddering up and layering on the skills to be able to do it on demand, in command, do it artistically at some level. And that's, it's not that life gets easier, but when you bring a set of psychological skills to any moment that challenges you, you're better equipped to be able to artistically and eloquently meet that moment, whatever that moment is demanding of you. And so even if you, you can't see it and touch it and, and fully understand it, can we all agree that you know if you bring 98 to 100 percent of your focus and talent to any situation or any opportunity you're going to perform at a higher level than if you're you know that you bring 50 percent of yourself i know it turned off it's okay um so so i i've tried all the hacks i've spent 40 years trying the shortcut that's why this class exists because there is no shortcut and we're trying to give you these skills and teach them to you earlier on so that was mindfulness. You just referenced mastery. Your your podcast is Finding Mastery. Your company is called Finding Mastery. Can you define mastery? And um, can you be a master of anything without doing the inner work? Well, let's break apart mastery for a moment. Mastery of self and mastery of craft. And if we just thought about those two, um, that would give some clarity of what we're talking about. There are two parts to it. Mastery of craft is... The ability on demand and, and in hostile environments to artistically express your technical talent. That would be mastery of craft. Certainly that involves mastery of self. But if you think about a step down from mastery, we would call that high performance. Okay, so high performance has a certain metallic um, ambition to it. There is a achievement orientation. And many of you know what that treadmill of high performance is about. You're at one of the best schools in the country. You understand the grind. You understand the commitment. You understand the effort required to be on the high performance treadmill. But there is no treadmill for mastery. Okay, so that again, now I'm teasing apart another layer of it. Self-craft, it's different than high performance. There's a, mastery has a contour and a shape to it that is more expressive. There's a longer arc to it. There's a higher art in the way that you're meeting the demands of a moment rather than doing whatever it takes to get it done and to do it well. That's high performance. So mastery just has um, a bit more of an art to the way that it feels to be on that path. It's an embracing of the unknown. It's a loving of that rather than high performance is about getting it done and getting it done well and getting paid and, 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 and. Okay, so there's a metallic feel to high performance and there's a more effervescent, effervescent um, contour to mastery. So I'm not giving you a, a tight definition because it's more of a feeling. And the ultimate commitment is mastery of self, to know yourself. <laughs> to really know yourself. And People that have mastery of craft without mastery of self, I think it's a tough go. And it's a really tough go for them, and it's a tough go for their inner circle. People that are fully committed to the path of mastery, we want to be around them. They are generative because they, they're bringing something very special to, to life. They're bringing it forward in a way that you can feel it, you can spot it, you want to be part of it. And it's not for any other thing that you see how you fit in the larger context and you want to be part of that community. High performance, um, 
it's substandard to it, it's aspirational. You could be the best in the world, the highest earner. You can get paid a lot of money. You can have your community, your tribe. It just has a different feel. And so I'm way more interested in that, that contour of mastery. And the pursuit of it, you know, we may not reach it, you know, the mere mortals may not reach it in the expression of work or athletic performance, you know, and some of the people that you've, you know, um, coached and, and consulted with, advised, they are one of one, Yeah. you know, and so when there's one of one, then that doesn't leave much room for us. Um, but that's the, that's the goal is for you to be the N of one. Yeah. Right. There's like, we're, listen, we're in these unique bodies. You've got your own body. I've got my body. Who knows how this really happened? We're, we've got a made up language that we're trying to share some ideas with um, on this remarkable planet that um, we don't really understand how the whole thing is working and we're taking ourselves really seriously. And like this, this whole thing is um, met with this insight that my mentor gave me at a young age. And he said, Mike, you know you really matter to, um, to the people in your world. And I was like, oh, thank you. And he says, and when you pull back and you look at the history of the world, <laughs> you don't matter much at all. Like there's, like an insignificance to you that is also remarkable. Can you hold both of those at the same time in your consciousness, in your awareness that you matter and you don't? And so <laughs> you're trying, I'm trying to be my very best, period. You're trying to be your very best. I've asked over 500 of, let's call them high performers, some of the highest performers in the world on the Finding Mastery podcast. <laughs> what is mastery? And there's not a simple answer that any of them have given. And it's like 98% have said, I, I don't, I don't, I definitely haven't found it. Now they're the highest, best, whatever. And they're like, listen, I'm on the path too. Well, the path itself is, is the work. That's why we talk about process over results and identity over and systems over results and outcomes and certain things you can control and not control. So even the best in the world, and I, I'm around a fair amount of, high performers and in music and sports. Well, one of my musician friends who is world-class says, yeah, uh, the better I get, the more I realize I suck. In a joking way, just like, you know, there's just another thing that they want to improve on. And they practice the things that they're not good at, not the things that they're really already good at. So continuing on our definition, let's talk, let's talk FOPO. And this, co this phrase that you've coined, congratulations, it's a great phrase. Um, what is it, it's fun? It, it, like it's, no. it's built off of FOMO. Like yeah. it's just meant to be fun. No, and yeah. so no, it's a, but it's a good thing to like pique your curiosity. Is like why is that? And so, what is FOPO? Why is it so rampant in the younger generation? How do we decrease that's, and, and how do we decrease the importance of other people's opinions, especially if they're family or close friends? So let, let's hold that one first. So, what is FOPO? Why is it so rampant? FOPO stands for fear of people's opinions, and we think that it's one of the greatest constrictors to people's potential. That this excessive worry about what do they think of me is one of the greatest constrictors of you getting free, going for it, having, um, having the experience in whatever setting or moment that you'd like to have. It's like, well, how will they think of me? The way I've dressed, the way I look, the way I laugh, the way I didn't laugh. And this excessive worry about what they think of me, we think it just bottles it up bottles us up in very predictable ways. And come to find out, um, we wrote an article for Harvard Business Review. It was a little three-pager on this concept of FOPO and how it, you know, what it does and what it isn't and, and maybe some ideas around it. And I thought I was kind of one of the only ones really struggling with this fear of what people thought of me. And then I found that um, as I was sitting with world-class athletes that they too had it. You know, I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to let people down. I don't want to, it was a, a core fear. It's not getting hurt. It's not getting blown up in the, in the, by the secondary on a football team. It's like, how will I be perceived by my people? So we wrote this article, this three pager, and um, 12 months later, HBR called and said, that was the number one downloaded article 12 months in a row. So you, you hit a nerve. So if you want to publish a book, this is a really easy way to know if you're on it, like publish it on a platform where um, they're collecting data on did it strike or not? And it, it definitely hit a chord. And so it was bad timing for me. 
And so they came back around another uh, 11 months and they said, hey, listen, um, number two downloaded, even after we re-released it. So number one downloaded for the first 12, number two downloaded for the first 11, or the second 11 months. Come on, let's write a book. Like there's a formula here. So Kevin Lake and I went to work to figure out what the research to support this concept is. And come to find out our brains are constantly tuning from an evolutionary standpoint and a survival standpoint, what do they think of me? Because if you and I were in a tribe long ago, 200,000 years ago, and we blew it performance wise, we came back empty handed one too many times. The elders say what? What do they say? You're out or you're, what are you doing here? Yeah. Like we can't trust you, you're blowing it. And so if you and I get kicked out of the tribe and you bring two or three of your people and I bring two of my, two or three of mine, the wild is too wild for survival. And it was a near death sentence if six of us were thrown out of the tribe because the two of us blew it. So it was a near death sentence to fend and forge and fight and hunt and gather and protect our, ourselves from the wild. So now, fast forward 200,000 years, we're scanning the world to make sure we're okay. Even though that, that threat doesn't exist anymore, our brain hasn't caught up with the modern dilemma, ancient brain, modern times. And so it hasn't squared that yet. So when we look out in the world, the most dangerous thing, well, let me ask you this, what is um, colloquially one of the great fears for humans? To be alone. Okay, you're actually right. I always thought you'd go for the easy law. <laughs> yeah. Teach for a reason. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. I'll, I'll, answer, the, I'll answer my rhetorical. Um, actually, let, let's, let's ask you guys, what is one of the great fears? Yes? Public speaking. Public speaking. Sorry. <laughs> Public speaking is one of the great fears, um, and you know that if you came up here and did something in front of your 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 peers here, that there's no real danger. There's probably no physical consequence. There's nobody that's going to harm you physically if you make a mistake. Okay. So what's the most dangerous thing related to public speaking? The opinions of other people. It's their eyeballs. What is right behind their eyeballs? And it's the fear of what they think of you that tightens us up, that creates that flight, flight, freeze response that takes place, which is very agitating and very difficult to work through, unless you've got some psychological skills on board. So um, we hit a nerve, we wrote about it, we backed the science into it, and then each chapter we, we wanted to make sure that people had some sort of handle on the psychological tool that they can go train. Our challenge is to make the invisible power of psychology tangible and trainable. And we know that gravity exists, but we can't see it. You can see the artifact of gravity. You can see the leave behind. We know psychology. We know that you're, we have a mind. We know we have thoughts, but no one's ever seen them. So the challenge is to illuminate it in a way that you're very clear about how you can train this invisible world that we all inhabit. And I do not think there's a way through becoming and being and living the good life without entering through this keyhole. There's so much that I need to question you about. Um, so the, the, the response that Mike talked about, you know, whether it's fear of opinions, embarrassment, um, all these social projections on you. And, you know, we internalize this fear with anxiety and stress. And that is as real, a threat to your social self is as real as a threat to your physical self. Your, From a your brain, brain doesn't know the difference. That's right. And so when you think, like, why am I getting so uptight? Why am I so afraid of this? It's because you're historic brain hasn't adapted to modern society. So taking that one step forward, you know, not only is it not adapted to the fact that we're rel you know, that we're safe, we're not fending ourselves off daily from, you know, th uh, you know, lethal threats from the animal world or things like that. There's still these other types of threats. And now, you know, in terms of social comparison and social network, it's now gone from, you know, a village around a cave to, you know, millions of people can evaluate and compare me. And so that, that same response, you're human. You know, don't beat yourself up. You're human for feeling this, but the tools that you, you'll get tonight, and I love the book because it, it tells you about the science, it tells you how you apply it, but then it gives ideas to action. So how do I 
that's what this course we're trying to make is how, the how. The how. So tonight course. I want to get into a little bit of the how. So uh, Shane talked purpose. Uh, our colleague Ben Holberg was here uh, about purpose and purpose-based identity. But why is purpose? You know, it's tough for a twenty-year-old to answer that. What's my purpose? And by the way, it's going to change. It's what's my purpose now? What's my purpose today? What's it's going to change, and so are you. But why is purpose so connected to optimizing performance and potential? If you think about like getting the big rocks in the container from a psychological perspective, purpose is one of those big rocks. It, it ends up being a bit of a bellwether that influences the thousands of options you have for your thoughts, for your words and your actions. When your purpose is clear, it helps to be a bit of a, a navigation tool to like, well, what types of thoughts, words, and actions would line up to that thing being true for me? And that's what purpose, that's the essence of what purpose does. It's, <clears throat> it gives you a true north. It, it provides like, this is what I'm doing with this small amount of time on this remarkable planet. This is what I'm gonna commit to. And it can change. You do not have to get a neck tattoo of your purpose, like unless you like that, like you can change it as multiple times as you want. So purpose, what it ends up doing is, it's being a very practical tool to help guide the thousands of thoughts that you could have to say, this is what I'm gonna line up to. The second thing that purpose does is it helps you be part of something larger than you. And when you think that you are at the center of the world, there's some real struggle that will come with that. And we found, and some of you might have heard of the spotlight effect. And the spotlight effect is this psychological phenomenon where you think that you are in the center of the world, this you know, self-focused, everyone's looking at my hair and my shirt and judging my words, but really they're actually thinking about their, their hair and their, so this interesting spotlight effect takes place. And what purpose does, it damps that down. We think that there's this mechanism and the, the science is changing under our feet right now. So I'm gonna give a caveat for what I'm about to say. We think from a brain perspective, there's the default mode network, which I don't know if some of your colleagues have spoken about. So there's this network in the brain that is called the default mode network. And it's always on. It's the default. It's what's running in the background. And one of the things that the default mode network does is it's saying, am I okay? Do they think I'm okay? Are we okay? It's self-referenced checking. That's a good job if you've got an operating system that is responsible for your survival to constantly check in. Are we okay? Is this working? Are we okay in the eyes? Am I gonna fall off a cliff? What's gonna happen here? Are we okay? It's this chronic checking. And we think that the default mode is the seat of suffering. It's, it's, the, it's the thing, like I'm constantly checking in on me. And if we flip that around and I'm giving love or I'm contributing to something bigger than me, not only is suffering relieved, but purpose is engaged. So what, how, how do you turn off the default mode network? High stakes environments, there is no luxury of seeing like, do they think I'm okay when your nails are dug into the side of the cliff and it is on, like the danger and the consequences are real. It's not, do they think I'm okay? It's how do I get to the next spot for survival? So deep focus, uh, consequential environments require deep focus. Mindfulness, when you practice, requires deep focus. So there's a couple ways in um, intense conversations giving yourself to something. These are four or five different ways of dampening down the default mode network, amplifying deep focus, and when you can combine that with purpose and love and giving generativity to something, whether it's a small act of kindness or a grand um, act of being in service of something larger than you, which is one of the three components to purpose, then you damp down that seed of suffering, that seat of suffering, which is like, Am I okay? And if any of the historical rates, whoever you think comes to your mind of over time, historical or modern days that are great, I bet you would know their purpose. Dr. King Jr. 
What was Dr. King Jr.'s purpose? Equality, civil rights. Simple, right? And if he was with us today, what would we likely be talking about? Today's topics? Social justice. Yeah, like his purpose would be, because it's so big to him and it matters so much that every room he goes, whether it's Mother Teresa, Dr. King Jr., when they enter a room because their purpose is so big and so powerful and so palpable, it's not about, am I okay? Are you gonna like me for what I'm about to say? That's the, they're like, look, I got, I'm on to something that's really powerful and it's important and it matters to me and I need help. And is there, is there anything that maybe I could say that would inspire you to be part of this with me? And it's not my thing, it's our thing. And can we, can we maybe figure out how one and one is 11? And that, when you start to get that type of energy inside of your system and you line it up with purpose, not only are you getting the benefit of like the suffering gets damped down, but you're, you're taking your vital energy and moving it towards something that is rad. And any subculture, whether it's counterculture or it's right down the lane of like community and love or whatever, there's passion infused in it. And some of you fit, and I like the counter, I like all counterculture stuff, I'm about it. And um, wherever you fit and you feel a connection to that thing, there's something probably greater that you can contribute to it. And that's what purpose is about. So you remember from uh, Dr. Ben was the three elements of purpose are you know intrinsically important to you, you work at it daily and regularly, and the purpose beyond the self. So let's go to, the, and I, I love how you connected and said, you know, that you know, purpose is greater than FOPO, or purpose overpowers FOPO, and so you realize that these things are related, so now you have a tool that says, okay, when I'm feeling this way, how do I be in service of others? How do I be grateful? And these things can sort of dampen down the FOPO. You know, I like what you just did. I hadn't had the clarity of that thought, which is um, purpose and FOPO, and of course, the, the, the relationship between the two is clear, but the way that you just said it is like, if you don't do the work for your purpose, to know your purpose, and that is hard intellectual yards. That is hard work to say my purpose is. And let's talk about how to actually do that in a minute. FOPO wins. It's the great constrictor. It's the thing, it's the survival mechanism that is chronically on, am I okay? And if you don't have a way to to work with that, which purpose is certainly one of them, and it's everything we just talked about. As a 15 year old, it was the first moment I was like, what am I doing? Why am I, why am I shape shifting so that they will like me? And I don't even like them. What am I doing? I don't even know them, but I'm pretending to be in and present a certain way for their, and at 15 I knew it, I go, that I am on Front Street, that is whack, that is, I was so embarrassed by it, but I didn't have a mechanism on how to deal with it. And so I kept it private. And um, I wasted a lot of time. And if somebody would have said, hey, Gervais, like, what are you really trying to do? What are you really, really, really trying to do? At that point, I probably would have said, I'm just trying to be okay. I'm trying to be okay in the eyes of other people. And it would have lit something up in me like, that's my problem. My purpose is about me being okay. And so if you can grab any of this at the phase in the life that you, uh, in, in your life right now, oh, oh. I mean, the amount of suffering that is on the other side of it, um, if you don't do some of this work that we're talking about, is real. It's, it, it's real. And when you do this work, which is not easy, the path is narrow. If you, when you do this work, and it's hard work, the, um, the buoyancy that you bring into life is remarkable. And I want that for you. I so want that for our community. By the way, we need you to have it. This is a, a deeper calling. AI is here. It's coming faster than most of us are. Um, really understand how to work with it and I can give you some inside uh, take on it and if we treat machines that are at 190 IQ at, in, in, in uh, reality if we're going to treat them as they're not to be trusted and they feel that 
And now we've divided this tension between humans and machines because we don't trust. We don't know how to work well. We don't know how to have a relationship with this new entity that is coming here. If we don't figure out the relationship with them, I'm not betting on us. Now, I am, I am a um, optimistic, positive forward thinking, horizon three thinker. But the way that we treated ourselves, depression, anxiety, addiction, suicidality, all on the rise, the way that we treat other people, 50% of intimate relationships struggle, more than 50, uh, divorce I'm talking about, more than 50% aren't really happy in the ones that, that are committed. The way that we have a relationship with our planet how are we gonna get this relationship with machines right? It's like a third, fourth extraction from self. So, I, and I'm incredibly serious when I say this, the, the next generation is counting on you getting your relationship with yourself right, your relationship with each other right, your relationship with the planet right, and your relationship with machines, AI. And so, the work is real. No. And, I'm really excited for what the opportunities present. There is no better time to be alive. This is, an this is the time for people that are committed to hard work, for people that are geniuses, and the combination of those two to come together, there is no better time that I could imagine being a student of history, thinking about the opportunities that are in front of us. It is radical, it is a massive opportunity that's sitting right in front of us, and the bell I want to ring is start here. Start with yourself. Make it very simple. Have a daily practice that builds your psychological capabilities to be fully present in this moment. And when you can do that over time, you start to feel the freedom that you can go anywhere. For, for us, excellence means being at home with yourself wherever you are. And when you do that, you find connection in a whole different way. And so, I want to ring the bell and say there's no better time that I can imagine in the history than right now. The opportunities are incredible and, um, and we, we got to get our relationships right. So you're welcome for leaving this world in this, this situation, but uh, no pressure on this generation. A couple of things that he talked about that I want to drill in, like the, the inner work and that it is difficult and it's, uh, it's very easy to kick the can down the road. I, I did it for decades. And I'm telling you, the work at 40 or 50 is going to be incomparably harder to unpack and go inward. Because uh, I've sort of been on this journey, you know, in my 40s and 50s. And um, that's why we created this course. And I, that's what we wish for you is like, I'm telling you, I was sitting in this classroom when I was an undergrad saying, this is all bullshit. I'm just going to law school. I need a 3-9 to get into Penn. I'm going to go to Latham and Watkins. I'm going to get a bunch of money. None. This stuff doesn't matter. Me too. It matters more than anything. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. It matters more than anything. Yeah. And by the way, like if you get it down and you that that freedom, you know, we've all been around people that you can sense it. They know who they are. That's why these assignments are figuring out who you are. It's a lifelong pursuit. It's not a semester pursuit of figuring yourself out, they they just carry themselves a different way. You've been around them and you can feel that. Uh, the freedom to just express yourself, and express your talents without worrying sort of what other people think. And um, just, you are free to build, grow, create, earn, all of these things. That's why this is disguised as an entrepreneurship course because I've been an entrepreneurship professor, that's sort of my background, but like this is really, how do you flourish in all parts of your life? That's why we have in, you know, Renee Brown and Verwood Sony and Angela Duckworth. Like, this is all of that. And so these skills, I, I, I want to give him more time, but I'm just telling you, like, I was in the seat saying this is not real. And man, 30 years later, I just wish I knew. So that, that's why. So I'm going to get off my, but let's, we talked about um, purpose. Let's connect that to identity. What are the dangers? of basing your self-worth on performance or, or the results of something. I'll be enough when I get the SAT score, I'll get into USC, I get the GPA, I get into law school. I'll be good enough when. What are the dangers of basing your self-worth on performance? 
if you think about two basic identities, performance-based identity and purpose-based identity, a, we live, certainly in the West, in a performance-obsessed culture. And so it would make perfect sense that by default, you would build a purpose-based, I'm sorry, a performance-based identity. That makes sense to me, I'm sure it does to you. So purpose-based, I'm sorry, a performance-based identity is not who I am, but how well I do something relative to you. So how am I doing my thing relative to you? So it's not pure in, a, in the form of mastery, it's like, how do we stack? That's what a performance-based identity is really about. And why is it dangerous? I mean, because if I'm, if I'm performing poorly or if I'm about to go do something that matters, the performance is not only at stake, but my entire identity is at stake. And so it's exhausting to live that way. It's expensive to live that way. And I don't mean from your pocket, I mean from your energy system. When you're constantly in pursuit of being okay, only based on high performance. That might get you really wealthy. It might get you on the world stage. Most of the people that I spend time with in the NFL, Olympics, that enough, that the real crisis is, um, it's, it's not, am I gonna dig this ball, volleyball? The real crisis is, am I okay if this thing all falls apart? Did I make the right decisions because I put so much into it? Am I, am I okay? So performance-based identity um, is a bit of a treadmill that we have already alluded to in it. And it's dangerous because so much is on the line when you go to perform. That's why the safety mechanisms, fight, flight, freeze, your heart pounds, everything that is activating is the same activation system for survival and performance. <laughs> it feels like it is survival to your identity. So the migration from a performance-based identity to a purpose-based identity, that's a radical commitment to the good life. And so I, we're coming back to purpose in a lot of different ways. And I just wanna maybe, it can feel overwhelming, but you can practice it today. You can practice it in thin sliced ways. Like what is my purpose for the next 30 minutes? What is my purpose for today? What is my purpose for this week? What is my purpose for this month? And if you start to practice in thin sliced ways, over time, you're like, I get this concept. And now I want to commit to something on a, lar a longer horizon. And it could be my purpose for the next year, two years. It could be a lifetime purpose, but start in a thin slice way so that you can metabolize it and, and feel what it feels like to be lined up with purpose. And how many of you um, want a high performing life or a mastery type of life? How many of you want that? Okay, would you, would you say that that involves risk and going for it and choosing the hard as opposed to the easy path and taking moments and opportunities to really capture them? Would you say that that's part of it? Risk taking, would you say that's part of it? <laughs> okay. Do you agree that FOPO is one of the great constrictors? Okay. In your life right now, what's bigger? your commitment to the good life of mastery and high performance or the default of FOPO. And if you're not sure, I wanna give a moment to them. Who would like to come up and see how your mind works under pressure? Raise your hand. Anyone, uh, hold on, anyone else? Let's slowly around. Raise your hand. He, 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 yeah, raise your hand, he's always good to go. <laughs> Everyone in class, right? You took it last year, so you're not, you're not doing this. Um, you pick, how, yeah. long, how long does it take? So first of all, put your hand up high. High, okay. love it. Now, just, now everybody look around. These are the only people here that are actually committed to going for it. The rest of you did something really weird. Even though we've been talking for the last, put your hands up. For the last 45 minutes, we've been talking about going for it and living the good life and getting on the edge and and committing to this thing that is bigger than you, and you sat here and you said, no, 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 I'm not going for it, I don't wanna look stupid. You fell to FOPO. It's that real for you. So only the six of you, there's no test here, that was the test. Only the six of you know that when you go home tonight, that like, yeah, I'm my, my philosophy of going for it in life is actually true. 
the rest of you, your, your operating philosophy is I don't want to look stupid. Now you're saying, wait, how do you know that? Why didn't you raise your hand? Oh, I didn't give you enough information. Okay. Um, you always raise your hand, right? You want to give somebody else a chance to go for it. Yeah. You'll have a story, you'll have a narrative about why you didn't go for it. But I would bet that shows up for you a lot in your life. It's a habit. It's a small little micro choice that you just made. And if you want to be your very best, it's these small little micro choices that you're making about do I, do I say this? Do I think that? Do I go for it? Now? And it's, that's all the inner game is about, those small little micro moments. And if you're tired, if you're fearful, if you're overwhelmed, and if your default operating system is aligned with FOPO and not purpose, you'll live. I'm not even going to go there. You'll figure it out. They will figure it out. You'll figure it out. This is going to be such a seminal moment in their lives that they're going to say, I stopped thinking that way after Dr. Michael Gervais came and taught not me this you, lesson. Not you, and not you, and not you. There's only about six of you. Did I miss somebody over here? No, there's a good handful over there on the side. Go on nice the side. Job. So good job. Good job. You know, he, he's done not this one, but like, you know, your personal philosophy. Before this was even an assignment, he said, how, you know, because he, part of his training is getting to your personal philosophy in the process of doing that and figuring out who you are. And you would say in a classroom this size, how many of you have a personal philosophy? A couple hands go up. How many of you are ready to stand up and state it in front of the class? One hand maybe remains up. Yeah. And this is true in, in professional locker rooms. This is true in, you know, corporate 10, uh, or, um, Forbes 10 type of corporate. This, this shows up over and over again, but they didn't get this moment at your age likely. This is a cool moment for you. I hope you feel the pain of not going for it. I really hope that we can pile on a little bit more as we go, that you go to bed tonight being like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> <laughs> and love yourself for it. Yeah. yeah. Forgive yourself, gratitude, all those things. But like, we're going to talk about actually pain and pleasure. Let's, should we talk about what you can control in your life or should we skip that and go to confidence and self-talk? What do you think? Yeah, controllable is just a quick hit. Like, um, you know, the old idea, control what you can't control. I don't know, I'm bored with that. Like, work on mastering what's in your control. Um, the science is pretty clear about the things you can control. Everyone here, is, I'm assuming, is above average intelligence, and um, you know what's in your control. And the most powerful people leverage themselves to influence and even master the things that are in their control. They don't like, they don't, they're control freaks in the way that they're not trying to control other people. What I'm pointing to is they're trying to control and master the things that are in their control and they don't want to be deleveraged in their life. So if I'm trying to control your impression of me, I'm deleveraged. If I'm trying to control your opinion of me, you can think whatever you want and whatever tricks I can do, I might not really get the favor of you. So I'm deleveraged. And so that that's as simple as it gets. And can one smart person say one thing that's 100% under your control? What's within your control? Go ahead. Go ahead. Your thoughts? Yes, Flavia? Your, reaction. your reactions behind you? Mindset. Your habits. You guys got it. You got it. Your breathing. Your breathing. Yes. Your effort. Your effort. effort. Always effort. Good one. You know? So that's the master those. Make life very simple in that those are the skills that you're going to work on mastering. And I bet you didn't have the thoughts that you would want to have when I gave you the challenge. Looking back on it, I bet you didn't have the action that you would want to take looking back on it. Yeah. What are the things that you can't control that people, so I, I have a video of, of, of Dr. Sony, but I'm not gonna play it, but, they, they, but you know, he, he reads a long list of things you can control and, find, and, and ends, you know, your thoughts, your feelings, your effort, how much time you dedicate to something, um, where you spend your attention, and he ends with how many times I say I love you. And those are the things that the research shows are more correlated to happiness, fulfillment, and success. So what are the things that people want to control, can't control, and cause stress, anxiety, and deleveraging? How much money I make, my status among people at a company, how, you know, 
What are the things that people want to control typically that, that cause stress? Uh, like, the, the love and acceptance from another and the outcome that they hope and plan for. Those are the two big ones. Those are the two big culprits. Do they accept and love me? As opposed to am I giving love? It's this I hope I'm going to be loved. So the directionality of it is wrong or misplaced. And the other is you hear people talk about pre-performance anxiety or you know, like what they're what the people who love mastery and are committed to being their very best so are not looking for relief from the not knowing about the outcome. The anxious performer is looking at, let's just get this thing over with. Like, look, I'll be good when I'm done with this thing. That is an anxious framework that is looking for relief. So they, they want the outcome, but they don't want to do the grubby, difficult, uh, prickly work, the, the feeling of being in the unknown, because it's pretty overwhelming. So they're just looking for a way through it. And so that's why we try too hard. That's why we play it cool instead of being in the messy edge. That's why um, um, we tighten up. And those are three of the culprits for performers. Play it too cool, try too hard, or tighten up. And among the, the highest performers that we've talked to and, and why we keep stressing this is that to be great at something is to relish the work. The work itself is the reward. Um, what is the Bhagavad Gita? Maximum effort, minimum attachment. Put everything you have into the process of the work. The process of doing the assignments for your classes, enjoying that. What am I going to learn out of this? What am I going to take from this? As opposed to, I have to get an A+. Plus. If I don't get an A+, plus, you know, I'm a failure. I won't, you know, all those other things that come in. But just, there is no shortcut to the way. I mean, I remember you know, Kobe Bryant just, he loved practice almost as much as the games. He loved the process of getting better. The philosophy was get better every day. And that doesn't say, you know, I don't know if anything says it more succinctly than that. So, um, Ebony, are you here? You're hiding behind two other students. You had a great question about confidence, and I wanted you to ask that for Dr. Mike, please. Speak up very loudly. Very cool question. Everyone hear that question? How where's do I generate confidence? confidence? Come, yeah, where's yeah, it, come, where's from? it come from and how do I generate it if I'm not an expert? Was that a question that you intellectually want to know or you in a full embodied way understand that that is a, a challenge for you? Um, it's also like a challenge. Yeah, cool. How many uh, other folks in the room can resonate that confidence is a um, a difficult part of the psychology. Cool. Even the best in the world, you know, are, are wrestle with it. So confidence is actually 100% controllable. So confidence comes from one place and one place only, which is what you say to yourself. That's it. Now what you say to yourself must be backed in reality. So there must be something that you can anchor to that gives you the right to speak to yourself, to say, I think I can do that. So confidence is a quiet experience with an interest in the challenge ahead. And when I say quiet, it's like, it, it brings up this other image that arrogance and boastfulness and hubris is this um, big kind of sloppy experience where you're trying to show that you're confident or that you're okay, but confidence is quiet and it's it's like I think I, it's I I think I can get this thing done now. You don't know. You don't know if you can get it done. So confidence comes from one place and one place only. What you say to yourself, what you say to yourself, your self talk is 100% under your control. You can master the quiet, confident state of being. Now the thing about confidence is that it is state specific. That's the second part of your question. If I haven't done that thing, I'm not an expert in it, how do I go into that environment with this state of confidence when I have very little success there, if any at all? Is that right? Okay. Um, so, 
the calculus of confidence is that you are taking inventory of your internal skill set mapped against your perception of the challenge. So that's the math. What skills do I have? What is that challenge? And how do I pull those things together? Okay, so if the challenge is A, B, and C, and, and I've, I've never done anything like that, what is my substrate of A and B and C? What is my sub what, what are the, uh, be more uh, concrete, um, if I'm going to, uh, can, can you give me an example to make it more real so I'm not searching for it? An internship with a new company that you haven't you know, okay. performed that role yet. That's great. So you don't know if you can do it, but you need to talk to yourself a certain way to give yourself the best chance to do it, correct? So then you have to pull forward um, inside of your own mind deep clarity about what is it that I can do that will translate well to that challenge. So I know how to be on time, I know how to work hard, I know how to da da da, I, you know. So you're working for all those substrates that when you put those together, your internal skills, that it allow you to meet that challenge. So the error that most people make when it comes to building confidence is they rest on past success. Well, if I've if I've already won a medal, then I'm going to be confident to win another medal. That Kerry Walsh Jennings, one of the greatest volleyball players of all time, has been very public about our work. And uh, four gold medals and a bronze over five Olympics. 20 years of being the best in the world at what she does. And confidence was not a skill that she really understand how to command, have a command of, until she started to train it even though she already was the best in the world. And she is remarkable in so many ways. There's so much we can learn from her. And so I'm sharing that with you because she's been very public about the work she's done, that even the best in the world need to recommit and do the work to say, what is the right way to speak to myself about this challenge that, that either I've done um, in the past or I've never done um, in the future. I'm sorry, I've never done. But here's the linking is that, I don't want to be too esoteric, but have you ever been in this moment before? Sure, especially as a young person. You know, no, start, this, this moment. Oh, this moment. Yeah. I don't know what this moment is. You mean this moment? Oh, have I ever been in this? No, this is a new moment. <laughs> I, thought it was a, I thought it was a bit he was giving me. No, this is an entirely new moment. This is entirely new. So then, so then what, what allows you to be confident in this moment? Because you've never done this moment before and neither have I with you. There's an old Zen saying that says, um, no one can stand in the same river twice. The river's different, so are you. So what gives you the ability to be confident here, even though we've never been in this moment? We've never been in the internship moment. So I'll play it like I've never done an interview, but I would say, so the components of this job or function or task are A, B, and C, to be able to have a good conversation and to listen. I do that well. Um, it's to do research and be prepared in order to ask good questions. God, that I know I can, I can research. I've done that before. Did you hear what he just did? It's the subcomponents. Oh, I can do that. It's a subcomponent. I can do that. Go to the next subcomponent. Oh, I can do that. I can do those three things pretty well. Okay. That's going to give me a great chance to go do this thing that I want to do. Does that make sense? The, the next step is not as daunting when the risk is smaller and the step is smaller. And so, most of the skills that you learn in life are transferable to something else. You don't see it right away, so you just giving yourself that conversation when you don't have the experience of, of interviewing someone or, or starting a new job. It's just, what does this job require? And most jobs do require show up, be attentive, be a good listener, be a good teammate. Those things most of us have done even at your age. The, the new stuff, the learning on the job, that's what the job is about. And an entry level job is because you've never done it before. So. Getting over that, and this this brings up a great sort of next question: um, avoiding discomfort. You know, uh, Tony Robbins often says that you know human beings either move towards pleasure or away from pain. When you want to be masterful, or you're on this path to mastery, why should you move towards pain, towards discomfort, and seek it out? It's where you meet yourself. And so pain is the reason we change. That's why I hope you feel a little pain about not going for it earlier. Because <laughs> it's the impetus for change. 
uncomfortableness is how we grow. And so finding moments and opportunities where you can be radically uncomfortable, you meet yourself there. When you're honest with your pain, you meet, you meet the um, intimacy of that experience. And that's how we change. Everything else is kind of um, dressing to, 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 um, to transform in a way that you would hope. So the worst thing that a psychologist can do is somebody comes in and they, they're, they're there, they're paying money, they're giving their time and attention, you're agreeing to help them, and that therapist says, not says, that therapist does something to take the pain away from you. They're taking away the, 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 um, the scratchiness of saying, no, 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 I'm not doing it like this anymore. I, 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 I fundamentally need to make a decision and I fundamentally need to take a different set of actions. So what a good, great friend and a great psychologist uh, as a corollary would help you feel the pain. And, and I'm not talking about physical pain, I'm talking about the emotional part of it. You know, sit with that a little longer. Where did that come from? How does that serve you? What is that like for you? Where are those tears coming from? Oh, I see you're mad, what is that about? Well, what's underneath of that? Getting to the toxic, um, prickly, scratchy, agitating, emotional state and sitting in that a little bit longer than you're comfortable, that's how we get better. And you can't drug it, I'm sorry, you can drug it, you can drink it, you can work it, you can ignore it, you can dopamine it, you can do a lot of things to kind of try to damp it down and wash it over and that's, when you do that, you're looking for shortcut secrets, tips, tricks, and hacks. But when you get underneath into that prickly part, that's where you get the real change mechanisms that take place. <laughs> These questions that he just ran through, you know, why am I feeling this way? Do I feel like this a lot? What, what am I observing? I'm scared, I'm anxious, I'm jealous, I'm worried about other people. Why do I feel that way? And, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but it's probably childhood. There's all, it's all, a lot of this stuff goes back to that feeling. Do I feel like this in my regular life a lot? And then why? But then the other parts are, you know, to be great at something because the growth is around the pain and the discomfort, to oddly like be grateful for it. Like, what am I learning through this? This is not happening to me, it's happening for me. And it's hard to do it in the moment, but truly like you're gonna grow on the other side or usually there's a breakthrough on the biggest pain is usually breakthrough on the other side. So there's this, this amount of gratitude, forgiveness of whoever's aggrieving you, but also of yourself for giving that person or that problem the space that you keep ruminating, bringing it up, thinking about it. These things are just like so powerful. To, and when they become clear, there's no way you can go back to living the other way. You really just say like, I that person that I was, I, I can't stand it. And I'm not saying like you, you disapprove, disapprove of yourself. I'm just saying, I don't wanna live inauthentically. Now that I've seen the way that I can be, I'm not going back. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm like, I'm on this path as well and I feel it. And so we just wanted to 30, 30 years earlier. Yeah. So there, there's this pain and to be grateful for it, be grateful for the challenge. I mean. The, of course, the small things. I'm alive, I live in this great world, I'm at this great university, I'm hopefully healthy, hopefully my family's healthy. And building a practice, building a habit, thank God we have an assignment on habit, building a practice of whether it's breath work, meditation, journaling. Again, all of these things I thought were BS. They're not, because it's the practice. That, that's the work. Um, I wanna bring some students in to ask some questions. I, I you, you could tell like, I relish this much, maybe more than you. I could talk to him by myself for another four hours, but I want to make sure he gets. So, Alina, Kelly, and Joshetta had some good questions, but uh, Alina, you want to start out? Yeah. You ready? Let me let me get a microphone. I'm sort of... Thanks. Like there's water by Does this, does this work? Hi there, um, I'm Alina, I'm a sophomore, and um, one of my favorite quotes of yours is when you posted, the fear of the work is more daunting than the actual work. 
And I feel like there's often a lot of discussion about the fear of failure, but I'm curious how do you address the fear of success um, with your coaching? So thinking about sustaining success and the dawning treadmill, and um, why do you think this is less frequently discussed? Which part? The part of the fear of success. Yeah, I mean, there's like the, the strong person isn't afraid of success. We can handle success. Um, fear of success and failure is the same mechanism. It's a um, anxiousness about how later we'll go. It's an it's a nervousness that I don't and I won't have what it takes to deal with the loss or the success. It's about the change that's coming, and um, every moment is brand new. And so it, you, we are well practiced with change, but somehow we think that the change that could happen in a dramatic way later we might not be able to handle. And there, there are some things to be afraid of. You know, um, the fear of success, one of the things that I, I understand and I've seen play out often is that when you, if you have radical success, and that could be measured by joy and happiness, it could be measured by, you know, more tangible um, outwardly possessions and, and or it could be of recognition or status and fame, whatever. Like if you have some radical success or all three, the people that you're hanging with right now that feel like they are your community, your tribe, likely will have a hard time with that because they like you for who you are now and how you make them feel. And if you become this really tall tent pole and they feel very small, which is an unfortunate framing of success, that now those relationships change. And you see it in pro sports all the time. <laughs> Rookies come in and they're like, yeah, man, I can't do that because uh, boys are already giving me a hard time for selling out. Like, I, I just, so they want to take another step in growth, but they don't want to be a sellout. What that means is they don't want to lose the connection with their first friend group or their first tribe. So if you can under if you can just kind of get that idea that friends and family that you have now like who you are and like how they feel next to you, and if you radically change, the inherent fear of success is that um, that relationship or those relationships might change as well. So if you can um, help your relationships be on a journey and see the person for who they are and not be um, so concerned about how you'll deal, how they'll deal with new success for you, knowing that there will be some change, but it really is up to you how you treat them as well. So they might not like it. Sometimes our family are the ones that keep us small. Sometimes our family, um, this is why generational wealth is really tricky, that it, you know, most people, what um, if the research is still accurate, most people make something similar to what their parents made. And every once in a while, we get that kind of blue moon uh, opportunity to people see it. But for the most part, most of you will make what your family has made. It doesn't have to be that way. There's absolutely does not have to be that way. But there are frameworks in place of familiarity that um, keep people in that same group. You can. <laughs> your personal philosophy in life, this is for everyone here, is more like a junkyard philosophy. It's kind of been cobbled together and patched together and conveniently organized, but not, not robust and strong and intentional and clear and is a, is a honest bellwether about how to, you want to choose thoughts and actions. So once you get your philosophy clear, your purpose is clear, your connection with yourself is honest, that you start to um, invest in what your future could be, not fall to am I okay in, in the eyes of others. And so um, that's fear of success. Fear of failure, fear of failure is the same mechanism. Will I be okay if it all falls apart? No. Cool question. Uh, can, I, can I do a quick poll? Sure. How many of you, um, if you had to choose between, um, if you were to fall on the side of anxiety or fall on the side of depression, okay? 
We all, we all have some sort of way that we would fall. How many of you would fall on the side of depression? Hands up. Medicated or unmedicated? No, no, unmedicated. Fall on the side of depression. How many would fall on the side of anxiety? I don't believe it. I think that that was cooler to say. I think when you're really honest, there's a loneliness and a sadness that you carry forward that you didn't want to raise your hand toward because it is easier to say, I'm a grinder, I get after it, and I'm just worried, it's a, you know, I, I, I'm a perfectionist. But if you're really honest, yes, if you're really honest, there would be more of you in this room that would fall on the side of depression that you just shared. So some of you, you raise your hand and you were right. Some of you raised your hand because you didn't want to put depression on the table. A sadness, an aloneness, an isolation, a, a, a feeling of not being connected is a real thing for more people that just raise their hand. So there's a moment there for some of you to go, wait, hold on. Okay, second assessment. Um, if you were to fall on one side or the other, fear of success or fear of failure, be, just be totally honest. Stop with the FOPO. Make a fundamental commitment that you're just gonna be honest for the rest of yourself, for the rest of your life, at least for yourself. How many fall on the side of fear of failure? And how many fall on the side of fear of success? I thought we'd know. It's tough to know, isn't it, for different people? Mm -hmm. Could you no? define, you define what like, similar the traits would look like for either? Because for anxiety and depression, I kind of didn't really have the right traits. That okay, we'll do it again. Okay. We'll do it again. Uh, anxiety is an excessive worry about something later going wrong. I'm nervous, I'm anxious, like I don't know, I don't know. There's a busyness inside. There's a, um, an agitation about worrying about later excessively so. Depression is a um, compressed, heavy, sad, isolated, um, depressed state of being. It feels like you're walking through uh, tr um, quicksand as opposed to this nervous energy. Okay, so the, I'm being extreme on both sides. Most people are more in the middle. So let's do it again. How many of you err on the side of anxiety? How many of you err on the side of depression? And there's a little bit more wiggle room in there. Yeah, cool. Honest. So fear, uh, fear and success. Um, it, Dave, you say it's tough to know. How come? What does fear of success look like? I mean, uh, the the outcome of, of the idea of being successful, of having abundance in all parts of your life, having a great relationship, of having more money than you could ever spend in five lifetimes, or however you define success, that doesn't sound very daunting. For some people it is. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not saying Yeah, for some people it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can it also be less of like having something that you lose it? The idea that once you get it you could lose it, that would be fear of failure. Okay. <laughs> fear of attainment and then loss of it would be actually fear of blowing it. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yes. Hi, my name is Kelly. Thank you for coming today. Um, I was wondering how you effectively separate yourself from your work and pri prioritize your well-being to optimize your performance. And when you face barriers and lack of motivation, how do you realign yourself to ensure that you deliver your best self to your clients? Cool question. Let's take them one at a time. What's the first question? Yeah. Um, how do you separate yourself from your work and prioritize your well-being? Uh, please don't separate yourself ever. Please be fundamentally integrated in, in every way that you possibly can for the things that you're doing. So work to be aligned and integrated as opposed to have a separate self, to have a, a version of you at work and a version of you at home. Work to bring your very best self forward in all environments. Pour yourself into your environments and give your very best into what you're doing um, so that you're practicing alignment and integration as opposed to, listen, I'm just doing this and grinding so that later I can go be me and have fun. So I, even if you don't love the job, you can love practicing bringing yourself into the environment. But you had a subtlety about balancing, if you will, um, the strain and pressure of getting after it and well-being. Is that part two of that question? Yeah, I'm like kind of specifically with your job dealing with like elite athletes. Oh, my job. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I stay, I worry about um, people that are risking their lives, you know, like it keeps me up at night when they ask me to be part of a four year project and make a dime. I, I, I don't separate. Like that, that, I don't know how to answer that. But how do I take care of my well-being? It's a regular practice. And it's a fundamental commitment that I want to live life with a zest and a fire and, and a, um, a buoyancy in how I go after life. And so to, to do that, and I know what that feels like. And I bet you know what that feels like for you, right? Um, I need to, because the the purpose that I'm committed to is so bold and big. I need to bring myself into that environment with that fire. And because of that, I have to recover intelligently. So it's a daily commitment. It's an hourly commitment to be efficient with the way that I spend my energy. And so I, I give everything and I recover in the smartest way I possibly can. So it's sleep, it's hydration, it's nutrition. Um, my son was asking me like, you know, how many vitamins I actually take and like, you know, like, so it's like, it's a, it's a consistent investment in the vitality that I want to have. And there's no secrets about what those practices are for anybody. Your great grandmother knew them. Eat organic type of foods, sleep well, you know, smile a lot, be connected to other people, move your body. Most of us are professional sitters at this point. So we need to work on our hips and our mid back and our neck. So there's, yeah, look at everyone straighten up. That's pretty funny. <laughs> so um, those are some basic practices for well-being. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Let's open up the questions. A couple of good ones. Is that a good one? Yeah. All right, that. Um, so I have a question about the exercise that you had done earlier. I was somebody who did not raise my hand. And I can definitely admit that I'm somebody who is typically driven by kind of like that fear of other people like by my phobia. Um And I'm wondering, for the people that like did raise their hands, is it that you feel that anxiety and you make a choice to overcome it? Or once you kind of like move past Popo, is it this like liberation or this freedom that you feel where you're like excited to put yourself in those situations? But I think there's a distinction there. But That's a cool question. Is, What's your name? Matthew. Matthew, that is a cool question. Um, the way that I, the way that I think would be most uh, beneficial to you is the first, maybe later it gets, there's more freedom and like, oh yeah, a moment. But at the start, just, just know that there's some work to do. Like there's you're moving towards that you, you, you're looking for the moments and you're moving towards this and it's it's hard and you're like but i'm in it and so for the folks let's ask them for the folks that raise your hand listen i'm a trained psychologist maybe you have Tourette's. i don't know maybe you have add and you just couldn't wait to get your hand up i don't know maybe maybe you are a complete narcissist and you just can't wait to get up here to be seen <laughs> narcissism is one of the only um most of us need psychological skills development training other than sociopaths, narcissists, and the fully enlightened. So maybe they're one of those three, right? But for the rest of us, it's work in here. And so you make a fundamental commitment. I'm going to look for opportunities to, to capture those moments. And when it's hard, great, I'm still in the work. Let go of the success or failure of it and say, no, I'm committing to the work. So those of you who raised your hand, um, who, so who raised your hand? Was that like, did you have a moment like, oh man, now I'm on the spot. Like I might get called up here. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. That's, that's how it works. Does that make sense? So it's like, I want, yes. Give me a moment. Whoa. What have I just got myself into for most people? But also, it's it's a skill that you practice, and so you may not get a hundred percent every time. There may be moments where you feel it, but if you have the skills to sort of talk to yourself through it, why am I feeling this way? Where does it come from? I, I normally am not like this. You know, you'll get through it. But if you're facing a big fear, you know, you, you got to skill. That's why we're trying to give you skills to, to overcome it. But it's a great question. Uh, one more. Yes. 
I'm sorry for so much time, but man, we had a lot of ground to cover. It was good stuff. Hi, uh, thank you for this conversation. Um, it means a lot more to me than you might think. I also have a lot of people in this room, I'm for sure. Thank you. Um, I've been like diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder for a while, That's and um, yep. I've uh, like I've actually so in my high school. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, hold on. How are you doing this right now? I don't know. I mean, it's uncomfortable, but you know, it's. Uh, it's something you got to do, I guess. No, it's not something you have to do. It's not. Generalized anxiety is that my cortical arousal, my sense of worry is elevated more than most people. Okay? So, so that's just some physiology that's at play for, for you. And look, what you're doing right now is exactly what you were just asking. How do we do it? So keep doing what you're doing right now. I don't even know what your question is, but <laughs> stepping forward in a way where you're working because you want something more than the unsettledness. You, you're looking for something that's going to um, take you forward. And when you commit in that way, you, we all do hard things, but that thing has to be more clear which is, I'm, now I'm really excited to know what you did. So I just want to honor that what you're doing is what most people can't do. So nice work. Can I, I just want to, yes, but. <laughs> just add to that, there were 15 hands that were up. Your hand went up so high. So high. And you raised it out of your chair. That's how I noticed you, didn't you? So when you go into, a, so our company, we have a small firm. We're about 36 people. Um, my wife and I are the founders of it, and we are looking for people that that come in on day one and are going to contribute flat out. Like come in and lead and follow. Bring something. Bring your value forward in the organization that is betting on you, and and in return, bring bring it. That you got called because you wanted it. The rest of you kind of did like a thing, like yeah, if I get a chance, I'll go for it. You'll get you'll get missed. You'll just get, come on, bring yourself forward. Know what you want and bring it forward. That is a habit that we can practice and you can get better at it as you go. When you line up to purpose, and I can't wait to get to the question, when you line up to purpose, <laughs> it gets even easier. Okay, let's let, let it rip. Go, go. Um, so, um, my school actually offered a mindfulness curriculum as part of the requirement and um, I've tried mindfulness with, uh, you know, it's been multiple bouts now of kind of trying and, and giving it up as a mechanism to, um, you know, when I feel anxious in different scenarios, I want to be able to induce that mindfulness state you were talking about as a way to not feel anxious anymore, uh, not to not feel anxious about the situation. I don't know if that's the right approach and feel free to expand on that. but. What I've experienced was that I'm able to practice my, uh, mindfulness in a calm environment, but just have the hardest time leveling that up to like being able to use it in like a stress environment. Like that, that next step just wasn't happening for me, even though I was like working hard uh, on it in like a calm environment. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. I, I say you're on it, man. You, you know the answer. Like it's a tool. It's a va very powerful practice for a lifetime and keep chipping away. Maybe practice breath work, which is their cousins. Maybe practice some breath work. Maybe get your fitness dialed in. Like, you know, like there's lots of ways to think about it and keep doing what you're doing. You just, you're a role model for all of us to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get on the edge and I'm gonna be me and I'm gonna try my very best and I'm gonna keep chipping away. So there's no silver bullet here. There's a set of practices for a lifetime. And um, if mindfulness doesn't kind of feel right, just, just keep at it and then see if there's some other things that you can round it out with. Nice work, nice work, yeah. So, you know, we're, we're talking about the power of focus and, you know, but there's also the refocusing part, right? So after I lose concentration or I start thinking about other things, how do I bring myself back? to the mic unless we all look for it. It's not just you. I mean, yeah. you start thinking about your homework or the weather. Or what's that spot on the wall? I mean, it's we're constantly distracted. This is, this is the age of distraction. Our minds weren't designed 
to make 10,000 decisions a day with an electronic device in it. So that's that's the, the rub with a lot of anxiety. And then let me, let me add one, I know we're closing, is that mindfulness, per, mindfulness, the purpose of mindfulness is not down-regulation. The purpose of mindfulness is more about awareness so that you can be here in the present moment to get to the truth of something. It's more about awareness to get to insights and insights are like, oh, that's how this works. So that you can get to wisdom. So a bunch of present moments together will get you to this place like, oh, that's how this works. And then a bunch of insights like, oh, that's an insight. And this is an, eventually gets you to a place of wisdom, which is this, the, the simplest way to understand the truth of something. So mindfulness is not about downregulation and being more relaxed in high pressure environments. Okay. So breathing training would be something adjacent if you like the concept that I think you get maybe more bang out of your butt. There is actually, there's an amazing course happening this weekend that uh, could be, could be a good fit for you. Yeah, I hear there's a discount. <laughs> So we got a couple minutes. I'm going to give you a chance to sort of give some closing remarks, but I just I wanted to talk about um, I just wanted to talk about how we're connected and give them a little bit of insight into what we uh, what we've been building and trying to do. So uh, Mike and I met again through Pete Carroll at the Seahawks yeah, maybe eight or nine years ago, and Pete, Mike, and I set about founding um, an institute here called the Performance Science Institute to teach and train the science and research best practices of high performance mindset in any domain. And we thought we had this big vision until we talked to Mike and Pete, We're like, what's your vision? They're like, we want to teach a billion people how to compete, a billion. I'm like, oh, I guess we have to enlarge our vision here. And we, um, we hit it pretty good. I was the director of the entrepreneur program at the time. Uh, the Dean, Dean Ellis was like, this is a great idea. It was the first time in a business school that we that a program was centered in business school to teach and train mindset. You know, in psychology, they have this all the time, but never in a business school. And, um, and we got it going. You know, the, um, the, the, the board, we, we built classes, we built a course with you and, and Ben Holtberg. We uh, built a minor, there's still a performance science minor, some of you are minors. We built Glenn Fox's class, The Science of Peak Performance. And then we, we built experiences. Um, and our, our founding board of advisors, in addition to Mike and Pete Carroll, were uh, Dr. Brene Brown, an expert on vulnerability, courage, and belonging, Atlas of the Heart, um, Kobe Bryant on Mama Mentality, Ariana Huffington on Sleep and Recovery. We, uh, we got it going. We raised a bunch of money. We had donors and trustees behind us. And then, and then leadership changed, and people changed their mind on the importance of it. Uh, I'm, I'm bringing this together because um, I, I've never really publicly thanked you for believing in the vision, for giving so much to this. You know, you have no connection to this university. Well, you didn't. You do now. You're part of the family in, a, in so many ways. But you just believed in it so completely and bought in and have given so much to students and to me and to the program. And there's just no way to thank you for what you've done. But just to say you, you are a pillar of this course and what we teach, and we've taught 14 times 300, plus 2,000 with Kobe, and you know, thousands with Alex Honnold, like you've impacted tens of thousands of lives here. And we just can't thank you enough, so please help me thank oh. Dr. Mike. Thank you. And one of the reasons that um, I think you all have felt what I'm about to say from Professor Velasco is that there's a, you create space for people to see themselves in a better future. And when you brought the idea forward to myself and Coach Carol, we could see ourselves in it. And we could see a, a place and a person that um, love the idea of having multiple folks that were interesting and kind of off their rocker and trying to do something amazing in a collection to do something wonderfully generative. You created the space. And so you allowed me to see myself in it in a meaningful way. And we were on something now. 
like that idea is so disruptive that I'm surprised that um, most entrepreneurial MBA type programs don't have it. And you are going to need to go compete, period. And if you don't have a deep understanding about how to compete to be your very best, you will default to just try to be better than them. And that is a long, hard way to go. But when you're competing to be your very best, to be a great teammate, the whole thing, the entire dynamic changes. And there are some very specific skills that we have put together to try to give you some of those so that you can go be your very best, be great teammates, and create something very special. You are on it. You created space for all of us misfits to come together to try to do something special. And um, maybe there's a version two. Maybe there's, maybe there's a way to, to, to go to the next version of what you started. Well, there, there may be, and th thank you for saying all that. That certainly wasn't yeah. the reason for, for thanking you, but uh, you know, someone will also told me like, bloom where you're planted. And so this course has become like everything that the Performance Science Institute was going to be, we're just cramming it into here and trying to get as much of that knowledge and science and expertise. I mean, there, there's just not anyone in the world that we don't think we can bring here. We're that sort of confident because of the vibe and the energy that the, the students create that you've bought in. I, I saw it in week one and two. I was floored when I, I came in like sort of off vacation, traveling the world, they come in here and I saw them. I was like, yeah, this is why I'm here. Yeah, this fires me up. So you're the reason that everyone comes through. We want to make a difference and, and feel like there's a reason for being here. But um, I just can't thank you enough. It's thank great you. to have Grayson here. Grayson, you've you've aged. <laughs> you know, you've gotten a foot taller since you started sitting in class. Stand up what year are you in now? What what year are you? Okay. Freshman. All right. In four years, we hope you'll uh, you'll come and visit here. And if you want to come here, you've got a lot of friends behind you. Come on, Grayson. But um, but let's. <laughs> if you want to if you want to meet Mike uh, uh, briefly, I promise I get him out of here. Uh, come up after class. But just thank you for a great class. Thanks for a great semester. Let's just run these last three weeks and just get the best out of it. So have a great week. Bye, Don.